We don't want to settle into those super crazy chairs right now. Yeah. Uh, all those 45 minutes there. <laughs> so, we've got enough time in for this thing now. Right? Trying to get out of here before we have any That's right. I want to start off with thank everybody for coming out tonight and uh, showing interest in uh, being prepared and taking actions to become more wildfire resilient. Um, that's the term that gets thrown around in our now. Resiliency is a terrorist because we all got to think about very close fire for fire. Our program that I have covered, yeah, that's, I'm all like this. I am just any wildfire resiliency specialist for statute law and conservation experience. Um, I have Alexis Price here with me. She's our community wildfire resilience technician for Sanjay Walker. Um, and then later on, we're going to have David Bell with DNR come up and uh, go over some, some information for you folks. Um, but we're going to start tonight um, on covering just what Sanjay Conservation District did and what we did um, on our programs outside of the wildfire. And I'm going to bring Alexis up and have that follow up presentation. Okay, thanks for coming out tonight. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about what the Magic Conservation uh, District does and kind of what conservation districts across the state do in general. So, Skagit, so conservation districts are non-regulatory and locally led special purpose districts that provide natural resource support and education to Skagit County. So in Skagit County specifically, we've been doing it since 1942. We work with private partners, local, state, and federal governments, agricultural and environmental groups, and other CDs. So Robert and I actually also work for Walton Conservation District um, and work in aspects of education, forestry, restoration, farming, and we're going to talk about wildfires. Good. Yep. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so a big part of what's got a conservation summer is farming. So we provide free farm tools to the local farm plant owners interested in improving their agricultural properties. We also do habitat and stream restoration. So the Skagit River provides spawning habitat for salmon and is the only large river system in Washington that contains all five native species of salmon and two species of trout. So Skagit CD assists with crack projects and SRF financial incentive programs to help riparian restoration and conservation. Outreach and education. So, a big part of getting people involved in these programs is outreach and education. So, some of the programs that SCAD does specifically is backyard conservation, watershed, masters, youth education, low impact development, voluntary opportunities, native plant sales, educational workshops, and formal recruitment. And what we're doing tonight is wildfire presence. So, what Robert and I do for the day is we perform individual home risk assessments, community wide risk assessments, provide support for the fire wise communities or people who want to become a fire wise community. And we also collaborate with partners on field production projects like biochar or shipping projects. And right now, Robert is leading the CWPP renewal process, which is no small task. So as he comes up here to do our portion, he's going to do the response to that. She said they were under the clock. Before I start this, I want to see them the CWPP is that's the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And that's something that is embedded in the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan with the Division of Emergency Management in Seattle County. Uh, FEMA requires that it gets updated every 10 years, that far outside, and we let it do it every five years. What we do with that is we engage several partners, Forest Service, PNR. All the fire districts, and we find out where their concerns are. One of the questions we ask the fire district chiefs is, "What keeps you up at night? What neighborhood do you sit there and think about at night? Damn it, if there's a fire, you know, a couple of issues out, people out, that kind of thing." And so we're trying to develop a plan where we, um, it's a process more than the plan, so it's all this engagement with stakeholders. Then we develop a document that um, targets these action areas and these action plans for things to do to reduce the risk of major losses during the project. 
But um, uh, if you'll give me just a second, I have some notes because there's a lot of slides and I forgot to grab them. Sorry. We're taking these Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, again, thank you for having us here today. We appreciate your interest in our wildfire resilience program. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of this, but if anything jumps out at you during while talking, just put your hand up, you know, throw stuff at me. Get my attention, we'll stop and we'll get that question answered here. Um, and just a little background on myself I worked in the wildfire resilience world for over about five years between San Juan Islands and now Washington Skagit. The rest of my adult career has been spent as a builder contractor on San Juan Islands. So I have a lot of experience on what can actually be done on a house, how expensive it is to be done on a house. So whenever I come out and give you an assessment for your home, I have an innate knowledge of what that's going to involve. When I tell you you need to put a smaller screen over something, I know it's not just a matter of getting the ladder and moving them through the process and it's kind of complicated. And I take that into, I take that kind of one of my personal, like that's, that's a good thing about me is that I know that how it can be done more simply and more cost effectively. And I'm more than willing to share that with people. I've actually done some consultations with people that are just now building their homes on what kind of materials to use and how to landscape that, that land to the So that's a little bit of fun. So, and you might not be aware of this, but what may is wildfire awareness. Um, it was so proclaimed by the Seattle Board of Commissioners. Um, it's kind of a nationwide thing, but they kind of make a big deal about it because they think it's a proclamation meeting picture that kind of thing but so it's really great that you have us here this time of year because there's messaging nationwide going out and that you're being a part of it which is fantastic so scheduled conservation district along with our partners has developed a multi-faceted approach to wildfire resilience uh, it's four prongs first one is empowering landowners with tools resources access to experts um, and those resources we support communities with wildfire planning Firewide USA participation, renewal, which is part of why we're here tonight, is the renewal part, part. And then we work with you know, fuel reduction uh, pro, uh, projects, programs, and we bring in a lot of our partners for that, particularly DNR. We engage those partners with shared expertise and collaboration. When we all work together, instead of working separately, we usually have better outcomes. We're not repeating work, we're not wasting dollars doing the same thing, we're sharing all that knowledge and working together. And then finally, evaluating fire risks. Uh, like Alexis said, we will come out to your home, we'll walk around your home with you, we'll send you a report afterwards that identifies some of the risks that are in your home uh, for wildfire. So, how do we apply this multi faceted approach to Shelter Bay? Well, first, we have to look at the characteristics of your neighborhood. First, I want to cover one of the terms that's used loosely amongst us in the wildfire world that a lot of people hear and understand what it is, but it goes like this. Delhi <laughs> new UI, Wildland Urban Interface, which as you see on the picture here, that's where we've decided to build houses right up against the trees. We've cleared the land, but we've got a border of trees all the way around us, and then fire happens, those trees are affected by the falls. The next kind of is the Wildland Urban Intermix. You'll all be saying it by the end of the night, just like that. <laughs> but the intermix is where we've decided is to drop houses down in the middle of the trees. And we have cleared the lot, put the houses in there, we just clear a road and a spot and build the houses. And these are potentially more dangerous type of neighborhoods, uh, but they, they're both referred to as the. Woo! <laughs> all right. Next slide. Here's an aerial view of Shelter Bay. And as you can look, We've got that interface on the edges. We've got the intermix where there's trees in between it. So whether you're interface or intermix, you are all. Please. You're doing it, Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> the maps we're seeing on the screen now are a very localized product. They show the level of fire susceptibility in the area, and this is focused on the Shelter Bay area. A little disclaimer, or Jay jumps on me, the data we use to produce these maps is not exactly the same data that other organizations across the nation use. If you're going to look at a regional map of fire susceptibility, we're not always that bright red, like Montana, Idaho, Eastern Washington, that kind of thing. But for our local conditions and characteristics, 
we are in the red here. We're very concerned about the stability of the surrounding areas and the stability of wildlife. And why are we concerned? Because what used to be an issue for the other side of the mountains is now occurring way too frequently over here. Um, it's not just an eastern Washington kind of thing that we watch on Combo News. It's now watching the helicopters fly over our heads and the fires out over here. Um, and there's some good examples over that in the last couple of years. And the most recent one was the Lyman fire just across I 5 from you folks back on April 20th. And uh, when Jay gets up here, he's going to cover some more about that stuff. I was fortunate enough to invite me out to do a post fire tour walk around that. Fortunately, no structures were damaged. One was mildly threatened, I think, um, but there were two houses up there and they would let us take pictures, but these folks were really well prepared. And, and that was probably the difference in things not happening worse than the problems. So besides the fires coming to this side of the mountains, and us building houses in the <laughs> there's other factors that are contributing to this concern. Most of them are quite climate related. We have increasing temperatures, we have less rain during the summer, and our snow melts earlier. And in some years, there's less of that snow to melt. This year, for instance, there's only 68% of our natural, normal snowpack on the mountains. And being in the middle of May, I don't think we're going to get much more snow up there. So that's probably what we're going to be dealing with. Um, also, temperature and weather forecasts for the next three to six months, you know, without getting into too much detail, we're going to be warmer and drier than we're used to when we experience it. So these are a lot of conditions kind of coming together and coming to a head right now. Um, we usually choose where we live because of what we like. So if we like trees, we like living in forested areas, we want to live amongst the trees in those forested areas. And when you ask a guy like me to come out and talk about wildfire preparedness, some people get the misconception that I'm going to be here until you cut down all the trees and move all the vegetation. Um, the Lorax is my favorite Dr. Seuss character, so I will never tell anybody to cut down a tree unless it is absolutely necessary to come out. out. And as you can see by the picture here, this is not Photoshop. That house was there during that fire. That house is still there after that fire. So evidence research shows again and again, there's some steps that we can take to protect our homes so that when wildfire comes through, they have a much better chance of surviving the top. Um, I'm now going to step aside for about 13 and a half minutes and let somebody who can do it better than I ever could, Jack Cohen, this little video. Yeah. So, question you talked about who you partnered with, and um, you didn't mention that the tribes, so the tribal influence. Because I know some of the national parks, like um, down in California and other places, have partnered with tribes in, to do the, the wild, you know, to, um, the, the forested land. Is there also a component? We work with the tribes to what extent we can. Um, it's been my experience so far that some of the tribes are very insular and they have some of those programs established within and they want to run them themselves, but there are open communication lines and, um, you know, so that we're always sharing new information and that type of thing. So I know I know that you border some tribal lands here and through our community assessment, we're probably going to identify that those neighboring lands are a point of susceptibility for the community. And that gives them an avenue maybe to request the IRF to allow them to do something. But we can't dictate to them. We are a non-regulatory agency. We make suggestions and, and smile. Yeah, well, I, 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 I know that some of the national parks that have had, been having some really terrible wildfires mm -hmm. um, now have their management of their, their lands through the through the tribes. Yeah, um, I don't think you ever watched the film Elemental. Um, it's on YouTube for free. It's a really fantastic film. It talks about um, the native peoples of California doing natural management of fire on their lands. Um, fire was a natural occurrence for lots and lots of years. We got really, really good at putting them out. And so we got so good at putting them out that these, the fuel load in the bottom of the forest now are very heavy. The native people used to regularly burn that on purpose to keep everything plentiful. And so that's, it, I would suggest watching that movie. But yeah, it was possible. I was just curious, did you mention that? Yeah, well, I didn't mention tribes and tribes and tribes and tribes and tribes and tribes and Yeah, what their participation was. Yeah. So again, I'm going to let Jack go and go. What was the name of the movie? Did you? Elemental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jack Cohen is a wildfire genius as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to sit down for 13 and a half minutes and let you listen.
Uncontrolled extreme wildfires are inevitable. These are the conditions when wildland urban interface disasters occur. The hundreds to thousands of houses destroyed during wildfire. Does that mean that the wildland urban interface disasters are inevitable as well? No. We have great opportunities as homeowners to prevent our houses from igniting during wildfires. Most of our perceptions are that these big wildfires are something we can't do anything about. They're overwhelming. If huge organizations can't control the wildfire, how is it that somehow I can do something to my house to keep it from burning down? It's not a matter of controlling the wildfire. It's a matter of changing those conditions of the house and its immediate surroundings. There's a lot that we can do to the little things to our house and its immediate surroundings in order to reduce the ignition potential of that house. I'm going to do an assessment on this house for its ignition vulnerabilities. The assessment is what all of us homeowners can do. Currently, we're not in fire season, but it's getting hot and it's getting dry. So this is a perfect time before the smoke's in the air to do this assessment. The great opportunity we have as homeowners is that we can do the little things around our house to keep our home from igniting. We can actually separate our house from the extreme wildfire. We don't have to rely on the control of the extreme wildfire in order to keep our house from burning down. Over the last 30 years, my colleagues and I have done research involving laboratory experiments, field experiments, and post-fire disaster assessments to, to quantify and qualify the relationship between a wildfire and a destroyed home. What we found is that the high intensity flames more than 100 feet away from the house are largely incapable of igniting the house directly. It's the little things that seem to be destroying the houses. The burning embers, the, we call them firebrands, lofted out of the high intensity wildfire to land in the community, sometimes directly on houses as well as the surroundings. It's not 100 foot flames, it's a pile of firebrands that would fit in the palm of our hand. So my colleagues and I designed a firebrand, an ember shower demonstration. We have a full-size house. It's got bark mulch and pine needles around the base. It's got pine needles in the rain gutters. It's got pine needles on the roof. We have an ember generator that then casts a brand blizzard at this house. In order for those firebrands to be effective in igniting the house, they either have to ignite the house directly or they have to ignite something around the house that then can spread to the house. The main factors determining this home's ignition potential are right here. The home's characteristics related to its immediate surroundings. For our assessment, our perspective changes to this house being one of fuel for the potential ignition. Look around your house and see where the litter, the leaves and the needles have piled up and visualize that that's going to be where firebrands begin to pile up and, and collect. So here we have pine needle litter right up next to the house. It's on the steps. It could ignite and start this wall and step area on fire. It also can ignite on this lathing, which is right up underneath the wood shingle siding, and ignite that. This doesn't burn with high intensities. 
it burns with low intensities, but it's extremely important. In fact, on this house, it easily could be the critical factor that leads to its total destruction. If this house had rain gutters, this litter would be in the rain gutters, potentially igniting and putting flame right up at the eave line, potentially igniting the roof and going into the attic. On this side of the house, what our attention should be on is this gable vent. It's the most exposed kind of vent. I noticed that it's got fine mesh screen, which certainly helps keep large firebrands from going into the attic and potentially igniting this house. One of the things we looked at were vents during the brand blizzard. The brands are directly impacting that vent opening. The burning brands can blow right into the attic and potentially ignite the material that's in the attic. The remedy is simple. All we have to do is use finer mesh screen to cover the openings. One of the important aspects that we demonstrated was that you don't have to have a metal roof in order to keep the house from igniting, from firebrand. What we showed was that any roof that doesn't ignite and spread fire can survive the brand blizzard. So as we previously demonstrated, composition shingle roofs with pine needles on them don't represent a significant ignition problem. But look here, we've got a wood-sided wall coming down to the top of the roof where this needle deposition, when it ignites, is going to put flame contact right on the side of the wood wall. This results in flame contact and high ignition potential resulting in the destruction of this house. The house includes more than just itself if there are outbuildings that are close enough to ignite and spread to the house. So maybe we have a shed or we've got a chicken coop which then can burn long enough to ignite the shed that's next to that which then ignites and burns sufficiently in order to ignite the house. So we need to be as concerned about the surroundings of our outbuildings and their condition as we do our house. I looked into landscaping, I looked into fireproof home building, I looked into fireproof uh, lawn furniture. I mean, I was going for everything that I could for the safest fire safety you could. And we had a checklist. No fire would stack next to the house. All of our lawn furniture was fire rated. I wanted to feel like if there was a fire, we had the absolute best chance possible of us and our house surviving. So some of the little things that begin to get a house during a, an extreme wildfire from the firebrands are, for example, something as simple as a broom being left out. Flammable deck furniture, where we've got flammable cushions on, on the furniture on the deck next to the house. The cushions ignite from the firebrands, they ignite the deck railing which is connected to the house. We put three foot of uh, rock siding all the way around up the house as well as in our landscaping three feet out of crushed rock. We talked to people, all it took was one thing, a fire, firewood stacked in the wrong place or lawn furniture caught fire on their porch. One tiny little technique that wasn't followed. Well, knowledge is key. The more you know, the more you can increase your chances, and not always does that have to cost money, right? It's just knowledge. It's still a shock to go through a fire, but to come back and see your home, right, that's such, an, uh, such a good feeling.
Flame contact on the house is a really bad idea. So what we want to make sure of is that we don't get flame contact on the house. We don't have a fire burning across pine needle litter, for example, and making direct contact with the house. But that only takes five feet around the house in order to keep the flames away. Let's take a look at the surrounding area of the house. Adjacent to this wood wall, we've got these green shrubs. So the question is, are these green shrubs a big problem and do they have to be removed? Well, as long as we've got green foliage without dead material, we're pretty good. But if we take a look, we've got dead material in the canopy and we've got dead material deposited under the wood wall. What we wanna do to keep the shrubs is to prune out all the dead material within the canopy as well as underneath in order to keep the wall and the shrubs from igniting. So we don't need to put out all the fires. We don't need to make sure that no fire occurs within the neighborhood. We do need to make sure that there isn't high intensity fire within 100 feet. And we wanna make sure that surface fire doesn't come directly to the house and ignite it. We definitely can't have a flammable wood roof on our house. It's the most susceptible to firebrand ignitions. But there are many things that occur on a seasonal basis. Cleaning up the litter around the base of the house, out of the rain gutters, making sure that we've swept the deck of, of pine needle litter and leaves, and making sure that our firewood piles aren't on the deck, and making sure that we've cut the grass and, and not having things right up next to the house that can burn. We've just taken a look at this home, but it's obvious that every home and every property are going to be different. That's why it's very important for us to seek information so that we can find the vulnerabilities to ignition of our own homes. Remember, if your home doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. You've got to act now to address these little things long before the fire ever starts. If you can't sleep at night and get on YouTube and just search Jack Cullen Wildfire, there is a couple hundred videos on there. He goes into real detail about why that fire mm -hmm. screen is a better idea. And I mean, his job is building houses and burning them down to figure out why. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and as was emphasized on the video we just saw, there are things that homeowners can do to protect your home in case of wildfire. And the most important thing we can do is concentrate on that home ignition zone. And when it comes to the home ignition zone, we're trying to create a defensible space, is the term that's used. That doesn't mean we want to create a space where the firefighters can come in and defend your house. We're trying to create space so that when you evacuate your home in a wildfire, you can leave with a peace of mind and there's a good chance you're going to come back to your home. You create a space where the home can survive wildfire on its own because the characteristics that now have. When it comes to the home ignition zone, we break it down into three separate zones. First one, the immediate zone, contains the house and the first five feet out. And the things we want to do there, or what's kind of decided on the film there, is clear the debris. We don't want to landscape with wood chips and mulch right up against the house. Changing quarter inch screens or covering quarter inch screens with one inch mesh screen. And always keeping the gutters and roofs clean. And you know, most separate points on those roofs where we have a wall the roof transition. We have dormers, um, we have valleys in your roof, things like that. And, you know, the rest of the country, they get to clean their roof and gutters once a year. Out here, we do it, you know, once a season, if not more frequently, depending on the season. As we go out into the second zone, we call this the lean, clean, and green zone. This is basically your lawn. And you want to keep things alive there, right? Green doesn't burn as easily as brown. So we want to keep things live and thriving. We want to space large vegetation and trees more than 10 feet from our house. We have trees in our yard, we want to break up that continuity of fuel. We don't want to fuse or a tree to tree can catch fire. And we want to remove ladder fuel so that a ground fire is climb the tree and become a fire up in the canopy of that tree. Using hardscaping, robberies, things like that, create natural fire lines. So 
there's a ground fire creeping along and it comes into an off-bustle area, it's just gonna burn itself out there and go away. And then the final zone is the extended zone. This goes out to 100 feet from the house. There's some instances where we take it even further, but I was off the house in a big slope or something like that. I spent over an hour driving around Shelter Bay this afternoon. I don't think there's any houses where we're actually going to be able to go out to that 100 feet where you're, you're your neighbors. So you do what you can on your property. Um, and in this area, what we're looking to do is we want to eliminate those ladder fuels again. So we want to trim all the trees up to 10 foot minimum, lower branches. We want to space the canopy out as much as possible and just be aware that these trees could be the source of those embers um, that come in eventually destroy your home. The majority of houses, a very, very large majority of houses that are lost in wildfire are from the embers. It's in the film, it's not like Hollywood shows up with a 100 foot wall of flame just washing over everything. And if you do go down the Jack Cohen wormhole and start looking at those wildfire videos, I'll ask you to notice one thing when they show fire pictures. Look at what burned and what didn't. The house is burned and the trees are charred on the side that faces the house. Not the other side. There's a lot of times when the trees didn't burn, but the house burned down because of embers that were coming in from further distance. So we have outlined here um, some of the next steps that Shelter Bay is actually currently taking, thanks to Renata and others, to uh, become, you are already a firewide recognized neighborhood because you are in need of Part of that's community assessment. That's why I was running around for an hour a day. Part of that is an outreach event, which is why we're all here tonight. And um, so you can see we've already checked off a couple of these items. So we're working with you for resident engagement. Thank you for being residents and being engaged. Uh, we've identified the areas of risk to Shelter Bay, which, you know, you've got a great area right here, but as we go up the hill, we've got more threatening looking things. Um, so the next step that we would take is the community level risk assessment. I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So the neighborhood or community level risk assessment, again, that's kind of like a windshield assessment. I'm just looking for the general characteristics of the community. We will follow that up with as many individual home risk assessments as we can talk yet to. And we'll take all that information, we'll compile it into a report. And, and that's a teamwork thing, right? It's not just going to be me doing it. I'm going to be making phone calls to the information from you as we do these risk assessments. And then from that, we produce an action plan where we're going to identify areas and tasks that we want to work on over the next three years. And then every three years, we revisit that action plan, see what still needs to be done, and what needs to be added for the next three years. I'm sorry. Um, research has shown that by taking the steps okay. that we covered tonight, that your home can survive wildfire. But unlike COVID, there is no shelter in place during long. If you get the alert that it's time to go, you need to go. And there are assets out there. Um, I was talking to Renato a little bit before the meeting. Your Skagit County Department of Emergency Management has multiple ways for you to sign up for alert notification. Um, uh, online, they, they will send you a text. They will call your phone, either cell phone or landline. And their website is updated multiple times a day, any mornings or anything like that. And this is a seasonal thing, right? In November and December, January, we're not really worried about this. Starting to be this time of year when things start getting warm, when we hear about fires on the other side of the interstate, you know, it's time to start being more aware, prepared, and looking for those things. And then, speaking of being prepared, the messaging that we're sending out when we're trying to align this with everybody else in Washington um, is ready, set, go. So, you know, come fire season, we want to be ready. We want to have that go back path, we want to have a plan in mind. Um, I know she has several evacuation routes here. Signs up. My opinion, most of those, and I'm probably, you agree with me, they're for tsunami. So for wildfire, you probably want to go in the opposite direction. And the best way to do that is to practice, right? Um, we were at an event last night, and the emergency management people were saying, take a different way home. You know, we all are creatures of habit. We want to take that shortest way. We're familiar. We know what Joe's yard looks like, and the city's yard looks like. Well, go drive by John and Gordon's yards. Try different ways so that you're more familiar with the roads. I know she gets some construction going on in here, so you want to be familiar with what's going on in your surroundings. So as you're trying to get out, you know the best way to go out, and you know that that route's blocked, you know, all the way out. Um, and, you know, a lot of that emergency management will help with alerts and stuff. If there's, you got to take some first responsibility, 
clarity of the routes and knowing which way you want to go. The second part of that is set. Once you've heard wildfires in the area of the city, now we've got our bag right by the door. We've got all those family photos and legal and financial documents in a fireproof box or in that bag to go with us. And we've got the car parked in the driveway facing out. And then once you get the go signal, it's time to go. It's not time to pack, especially when we have to. So ready, set, go is the message. This is pretty much in my presentation, but I just, uh, in closing, want to thank you all for being here tonight. I want to thank you for your interest in our wildfire resilience program. I hope we've given you some information, uh, resources. We have some pamphlets and handouts over here. My analysis is cars over here. Please feel free to reach out and contact us anytime. They say walk the conservation district on us. That's because we're our office that we work for Scattered as well. Um, but beyond all that, I hope that I've given you a little. I don't know what the word I'm looking for here. I mean, didn't write it down. But I don't feel empowered that there are things that you can actually do to protect your home in case of wildfire. You not just have to grab that bag and go and worry about getting the insurance. There are steps that you can take so that when you go, you have a good confidence that you're going to come back to your home. And with that, I'm going to introduce you to Jay McMillan from Washington, New York. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, like Robert said, my name is Dave McMillan. I'm the fire management officer for the Salem Fire Unit, which Shelter Bay it resides in. Uh, my fire unit is Snohomish County, um, the island part of Skagit County, so um, Fidalgo Island, Fur Island, a little bit out towards Lake McMurray, and then Island and San Juan County are in my fire unit as well. So, um, Again, thanks for, for having me out here tonight to talk to you a little bit about um, how you can be more resilient um, if there is a wildfire in your community. Uh, like, like Robert was just sharing with all of us, steps we can take to be prepared for a wildfire and, and what kind of uh, response that you would see in your community from, from the DNR and the local fire, fire department. Uh, if there is a, a wildfire in the community. And so um, I apologize if you see me looking at my phone. My, my notes for my presentation are, are here on my phone. So that's why I'm kind of just glancing at those to, to speak to these slides. And so I'd like to get started by saying, you know, a lot of us have this perception that if there's a fire in our community, the fire departments can come and, and save us, right? They're going to show up and they're going to protect my home. They're going to protect my neighbor's homes. Uh, and, and the reality is, is there's just not enough firefighters, right? We know that, that Woody and, 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 and Jamie and the guys over here at the station, uh, they're maybe only like five or six of them working. And they, you know, even if they call in all the volunteers, you know, maybe there's be 10 or 15 of them. And they only have but five or six trucks. And there's hundreds of homes in, in the community, right? And so, um, there we go. We have a fire. I'm getting a fire call in, in Burlington right now. So, so I apologize for that news. But um, and so we have to make our homes resilient because we just know that there's not enough of, of the fire fighters, right? There's not enough of us to come in here and save everybody's home. And so that's why it's so important to make our homes resilient. And by resilient, I mean that when we leave to go come down here to the golf course and marina. To a safe location when the fire happens, that we, we feel confident and when we return to our home, it's still going to be standing like Jack Cohen showed us to do, right? Like we construct our home out of the correct materials. We, and the most important thing is just keeping it clean, like Jack was saying in that video. So, um, you know, we, we just want to make sure that, that we are resilient. And that's that word that Robert was talking about that resilience is, is better than preparedness, right? Preparedness is part of it. Um, can, can you flip to the next slide, Alexis? Thanks. And so, how does wildfire work, right? Like we know that fire is a, is a is a chemical process, right? It's a combustion. So it takes oxygen, heat, and, and fuel, and then you, there you got a fire. But what if you have a fire in house? You know, and how do these fires get so large and out of control? And and so it takes the weather 
and the, the lay of the land, the topography, and then the fuel, right? Like fuel is everything out there that can burn. And, and we as firefighters even look at the homes as fuel, right? If a if a home catches on fire, it's a, a it's an ignition source. It's putting off a lot of radiant heat and it can ignite the home next to it or the building next to it or the vegetation next to it. Um, you know, vehicles could also be considered fuel, right? Like when a when a vehicle or a boat in the driveway catch fire, they're, they're also going to produce a lot of a lot of heat and throw embers and things out. And so it's not just the vegetation that's fuel, but it's also all the other stuff out there. Uh, and so what's, what the main driver of a fire is, next slide please, is the wind. You know, and so the, if you have a small wildland fire, brush fire, whatever, out here um, in the afternoon, and it's really, really windy, you know that that fire is going to move really quick. And, and so people are amazed at how fast fires move and, and how large they get in a short span of time, right? And so the, the wind lays the flames over and, and helps preheat the, the fuels and things out there ahead of that fire. And so you know, we see a lot of these large catastrophic fires that are occurring on these really windy days in, in the summer, kind of hot and dry. Um, next slide, please. Or sorry. Um, yeah, so fire weather, right? So how many people have heard of a red flag warning or, or some sort of a fire weather related warning? Well, that's what, what this, this is telling us a lot of kind of news organizations are going to are weathermen, um, the National Weather Service, however you all are, are getting that information. Um, and, and typically in Western Washington, these red flag warnings are going to be for high temperatures. And so like when it's 85 degrees and above outside in low relative humidity, and that's the amount of moisture in the air. And so in Western Washington in the summertime, when we have high air temperature, we have low relative um, when we have low air temperature, we have high relative That's kind of how that works, in, especially in the summertime in West Washington. Um, the other thing when we're looking at a red flag warning would be a high wind. So like if we're having really, really um, elevated winds, you know, 15, 20 mile per hour steady winds, and, and especially if they're coming out of um, an east wind. They call them Santa Ana's in California. Um, Firm winds, they have different names, but anytime in Western Washington, if we have an east wind, um, it's going to usually be that elevated fire danger risk and, and a red flag warning associated with that. And so um, when we see that we're having this red flag warning, what are things that we should be doing and be aware of, right? So we should be probably hypersensitive to smoke, right? Like when our neighbors are burning, that's probably not a good time to burn just during these things. So just being very vigilant, um, looking out for each other, uh, and just being hyper aware of if a fire did start in these conditions, uh, it could get large quick. Um, next. So this is what the wind does to a fire. And remember Jack said that the embers are what are, are going to ignite your home materials on fire. And so when we have a really windy wildland fire, an extreme fire event, it's not that raging wall of fire that's going to come through and, and hit your home and your, your uh, property. It's all of these embers that are being blown out of the head of the fire and landing and causing more fire. And then whatever they catch on fire does the same thing. So it's just kind of that new prop. Of, of these firebrands and embers. Here's a, a beautiful shot of, of your community, right? We're looking out towards, out to the west towards Mount Erie. Um, and, and remember, what was that cool W starting acronym that Robert said? <laughs> the movie, right? It's kind of movie. So I love, I love this photo because it really shows that that you are living in that, not only the interface, but the interface. So you can see all of these homes and all of this vegetation that is going to fuel for a while in the fire.
So divisible space is important. Remember uh, Jack talked in his video about how to move out to 100 feet, and like Robert said, in this community, 100 feet should be tough. I mean, some of our homes are a lot closer than that. And we, and honestly, I'm I'm with Robert. I love trees. That's why I live in the city of Northwest, and that's why you all live here in South Bay, because it's a beautiful community, and the trees are beautiful, right? But there are things we can do to prevent something like this from occurring. We can we can clean up those those ladder pools that, that are going to let the fire go from the ground up into the camp. Um, you know, just thinning thinning out a little bit. This obviously, this photo is from. Eastern Washington, last year, the Great Great Road Fire, the Great Fire, we went into that fire in Spokane last year. Several homes were destroyed in that fire. And so uh, that's what this photo is from. And this was taken at probably like uh, one in the afternoon. And so that, you know, you think this, this photo was taken at night. Well, that's what a wildfire looks like to me when we're actually there in you know, a fire in that fire. Uh, next. And we all think that um, fires only happen in eastern Washington. Um, you know, the, the growing threat of wildfire in western Washington is really coming to light. Um, you know, we've seen over the years um, things like this. This is the Sumner, um, the Sumner Grade Fire. Uh, it burned down in Enumclaw in, in 2020. And so just four years ago, um, you know, we had that fire. Um, in 2022, we had a, a little fire called the Gold Creek Fire by Sky Comish. It burned 8,000 acres in a period of like eight hours. And so it, it got really big really fast and, and threatened the communities of Sky Comish, Grotto, Barry, and New um, And we were very fortunate to not lose any homes in that fire. Um, and then here we have a photo of the, that fire in Inupla in 2020. And this is showing us that, you know, even if a fire starts outside of your community, it can easily burn into your community, right? So the fire doesn't even have to start in Shelter Bay to, to be a threat to Shelter Bay. We talked about evacuation. Uh, you know, it's really important to have a plan in case you do have to evacuate. And we call it the five, the five P's of preparedness, right? So we want to, we want to account for our people. We need to know that we, we have all of the people in our family to account for. We need to account for our pets. You know, so our pets are, in my family anyway, the pets are kind of more important than people. Prescriptions, <laughs> um, right? And so I know that prescriptions are important as well for us to continue to keep going, you know, and um, the photos, you know, how many of us, our whole life history is in the photo albums? I know now we're all, us younger people are digital and everything like that. I, think I still have a lot of my, my 20s and 30s are in photo albums, and even before. And I know in pictures of our families on the wall, right? So photos are also an important thing to grab. And your papers, right? Your important papers. And, and, don't depend on a, a fire rated safe unless it's a really fire rated safe. A lot of these seven eight hundred dollar safes that you're going to buy at Costco may or may not um, protect your important features. So it's good to have a plan. Grab those things and be prepared for heavy traffic on the roads. If there's a fire in the community or threatening the community. Um, people are going to be driving. They're going to be evacuating, and then emergency responders can be coming. And so it's going to be very hectic. Um, next slide, please. And so you guys have a great location to go to if there is a fire in your community. And it's right here. It's right here. Right there. Like this, this is a beautiful, amazing spot. We would actually, in my business, let's call this a safety zone for the fire. So firefighters would come to this area for protection of the fire. And so, for all of you, you have a great safety zone right here in shelter, you know. And so, you know, if you want to evacuate to somewhere, you have an emergency plan. If there, in case of a wildfire, this is a great spot, right? If fire is indiscriminate, 
fire does what fire does. It's not um, picking on one person as opposed to this person. It, it did, you know, fire is a, a living, breathing, sentient being. It's just that chemical process. It, it responds to what's out there. And so this person had something going on differently than this person. Because this, this home is still there, this home isn't. So fire doesn't discriminate, it's just going to burn what's available to burn. Uh, and so you heard Robert mention earlier the, the fire up in Lyon back in April. Uh, we had a 50 acre fire uh, and it threatened several homes. It, and you can see in this photo that there's several homes really, really close to that fire. Uh, and it, it had some pretty um, extreme fire behavior for Western Washington and the uh, next slide. Uh, there's another shot of just how close it was to some homes and residences and some of the flames over here. And that's a view of the fire perimeter uh, and, and the, the vicinity of the, the surrounding homes and, and like Robert said there was one one uh, resident outbuilding up here in the middle of the fire that they had um, good defensible space around it and so we were able to protect and save that home but you can see the potential if this fire had happened in August or September this could have been a whole other story we, we probably would not have been able to contain it and get it under control as quickly as we were able to um, in April so, uh, you know, the time of year and when these things happen also plays into how large they get. And something I wanted you all to think about is if we had a fire this size in Shelter Bay, what would happen? So, that's something to ponder as well. So, in, in our region, Northwest region, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, we cover from the Canadian border to the King County line. We have, we have two fire units. We have the Colson Fire Unit and the Salish Fire Unit. Like I said, you all are in the Salish Unit, but you're right in the middle of our two units. And so you're going to you're gonna have good protection and good response from both units if we, if we do get a fire. We'll have, we'll have a pretty large response. Um, the FMO and AFMOs, those are like the chiefs. And so uh, we have three in each unit. We have a fire management officer and two assistant fire management officers. And they're usually the ones that are going to show up and, and be the innocent commander. They're going to be the ones that are directing aircraft and ordering more people and things like that to come to fight the fire. Uh, and then we have our, our 10 four person wildland fire engine crews. And so it's a it's a four-wheel drive truck with like 500 gallons of water in the back and four young, um, motivated and ambitious, strong firefighters. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so there's five in each of the units, and then we have two 10-person uh, hand crews for suppression models. And so they're the ones that show up and get the chainsaws out and hand tools and dig and, and things like that. Um, we have our helicopter based out of it. And so uh, if there was a fire out here in your community, we would, we would immediately get the helicopter and fire engines and probably some of those uh, AFMOs heading out here um, as soon as we're notified. So that's it. While I was presenting earlier, you heard that beeping going off um, on my phone. Well, we're notified from Seattle Town when there was a brush fire in Seattle. So, uh, we're notified when the fire department so Obviously, they're going to be the first ones to get here. Uh, and, and we love our fire department um, partners because, like, like what I like to call them, the tip of the spear. They're the first ones that are going to show up. And we want to be able to control and knock these wildfires down when they're small. So they're much easier, easier for us to get under control when they're small. And so um, that's what we have for our fire suppression resources. And uh, yeah, and if uh, anybody has, next slide, anybody has any questions? I'm more than happy to answer. Yes. 
Uh, what we've experienced here is um, that we don't have adequate fire guidance. Does that change your model? You know, I, fire hydrants to me are kind of lush because I, I grew up fighting fire working for the U.S. Forest Service and we didn't have fire out there. And, and all I know is you have adequate, ample um, water supply and it's called the, the Sailor's Sea and the Swimmer's Channel because we're not afraid to, to use that salt water to find what we have. And so we also have um, we have a water tender, which is a 1500 gallon truck that can bring water to the fire. And I know that District 13, um, your, your fire district has, um, I think, at least maybe one, if not two, water tenders. And District 11 and Mount Erie, they also have water. So we would we would have supply um, if we did. But that's good. I like that. Um, because that's the type of thing, you know, for, for planning, uh, it's good to know. If, if you do then have a plan, right? Especially for the structure protection stuff. Um, if the fire department is in here, because they're the ones that are going to be probably using that water if one of the homes has to be. Is it? Um, so when we did the fire line, you still remember the same year to me. When we came to my house and uh, when we said four feet up on the trees, he said ten feet up on the trees. And our county only says we can go six feet up. Next message, right? <laughs> yeah. So ideally, we want the higher up we can go, the better, right? Because we, we're thinking of what the vegetation is on the ground, and so how high of a plane is that vegetation going to put off? Because why we want to cut those low hanging branches is because they're going to catch fire from, and, and then when that whole tree goes up, that's going to throw a lot of those fire brands out and cause a lot of our chaos. Um, and so I would say go with the six feet if that's what, it, what is appropriate here at the Shelton Bay. That, that's good. But a good question. Um, and, and you know, with, with FireWise and, and a lot of this physical space, um, it's evolved and it's changed. You know, the information is. It, Constantly changing, right? But it's changing in a good way. Uh, because when I first started a long time ago, uh, we were more of a get rid of all the vegetation and make it be just this big green, cut all the tree down, um, which we know that nobody wants that. Right? That's, there's a reason why we live where we live, and it's a beautiful area, and we want to keep it beautiful. Part of it being beautiful. It's keeping it from burning down too. So, well, thank you all. I appreciate you inviting me out this morning. And uh, just another note: if you do end up in the future um, putting together some projects of like fuel reduction, um, cleaning up some of the green areas and things like that, it most likely will be some of the, some of our you know, our fire crews that will come in and assist you all with some of that. Really. So that is available, and, and Robert can, can help coordinate that, that work. And we just got done working on the island um, with Holland, with the Wood Conservation District on three firewise communities just a couple of weeks ago. So we're more than happy to come into your community and help make you all more resilient and safer from the threat of all. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. I have a lot of really, really great information, and thanks for sharing the localized stuff on um, what this place looks like and the experience of the land. It's really great. Um, so, we're pretty much wrapped up for the evening. I just want to stress to you that we do have a sign up sheet over here for the home risk assignments, uh, assessments. It is an assignment to sign up. <laughs> um, but this, that will be the next crucial part in us getting you renewed for firewalls. To be able to come out and look at some individual homes and uh, if something else that we could possibly do, if you and two or three of your neighbors all want to do the assessment that scheduling time is kind of difficult, I'm happy to come out and do an assessment on one house with four or five homeowners walking around with me. We'll point out things and you can go and do your own assessment. One of the pamphlets we have here is, um, it's called what's this? Prepare your home. 
And it's a trifold thing, and it basically goes over the home admissions zone, and it'll go step by step the things that you're looking for. So this could be a self directed thing, but also we're happy to come out and do the assessment for you. And again, that assessment is going to produce a report that has a bunch of mumbo jumbo in it. It also has some very good information, but for me, the most important part of the conversation we have all the while. Point out things that I see, you point out things that I don't see. We talk about everything, and everybody has a better understanding. So, again, I encourage you to sign up, take any of the information that we have here. We have some smoking bear stickers with three bigger magnets that everybody needs one. So, uh, please help yourself. And one more question, or however more question, we'll be around in the class. So, if you sign up for your home assessment and you find some things that are you consider deficient, <coughs> does that go against um, shelter baby? And, uh, no, no. So, you can make recommendations. Actually, make my job easier. Now I just identified something I can write. I don't have to go searching for something. Yeah. No, there's, we're non regulatory. Um, and so, <coughs> you know, if, if we see anything, we can't report it, we don't report it. But it also is not enough. It's just this is all a positive step forward. We want to take those steps and those actions to be more visible. So you need us to sign up to so we can make people get better and quit. We don't get yeah, them to go from the Well, if you had it done like in the last five years, I'd say you would probably do the whole kind of what three years. Oh, yeah, there's a three the three block. Yeah, awesome. So just continue to do those things. You know, and it's a maintenance thing because the vegetation continues to grow, so you don't do it one time. And the thing I like about the firewise actions and practices is every one of them are also good home maintenance practices. Right? Not only protecting these wildfires, but protecting our investment from rotting and deteriorating. So it's, it's kind of a win. Another question? Um, is there a certain percentage of homes that you like to assess in um, you know, honestly, I can assess one and just take that information and expound it, you know, on paper to this is what everybody in there should look for. I, like I said, I was here for over an hour driving around the neighborhood. There's, your, your biggest concern here is vegetation. I didn't see a cedar shingle, cedar shingle roof. Um, every, all the roofs look good. It's just what's growing up against the house. Mm -hmm. The period of time the houses were built was one of the concern, right? So we use some building materials that look really good, but they're too close to the ground for exciting. You know, we let debris kind of build up there and we plant ferns all the way. And ferns are beautiful, but they're terrible because they're just constantly dying and growing and dying and growing. All that bad stuff is, if you're ever camping, just grab some of that and start a fire for Lucy, you realize you're a lot of your house. So, there's another question. Okay, Renata, thanks for having us out. Everybody, thanks for being here and grab some stuff and give me your numbers. There's also the pricing plan. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.